Okay, uh, I think we can get started. Uh, we are about on time. Uh, thanks you, thank you for joining my session. Uh, I'm the guy that stands between you and lunch, so I will try to get through this quickly uh, so we can all go in it. Uh, and I'm, today I'm going to be talking about strategies for deploying, developing and deploying embedded applications and images. Um, and for you that attended the previous talk in this room from my colleague, Drew, uh, there is some overlap, or I'm going to go into some details uh, of some of the features that he mentioned. Um, so the scope, uh, what we are talking about today, is uh, this loop while you are developing uh, uh, applications or when you're developing your embedded system, uh, where you build some kind of software, uh, you need to deploy it to your device, you need to test it. Uh, and what we are trying to do here in, in, my, in my session is to take a look uh, at a few of the tools that are available to us. Uh, it's also telling a bit the story that uh, I've been through uh, throughout my career in embedded Linux, the tools I've used and what I use today uh, as my primary tools when developing uh, systems and applications. Um, so, quick overview, more detailed overview. Uh, we'll try to take a look about, a bit at desktop environment and how that works when you, when you work, uh, when you develop uh, applications and uh, Linux systems. Uh, I will take a look at the, uh, the embedded environment that's available to us as well. Uh, and I will try to take a look a bit on uh, development workflows using package managers, but also using uh, Yocto UA Core uh, package management system. Uh, I'll get into that a bit uh, later. Uh, we'll also take a look at network booting and using uh, a software update solution as a development tool uh, as well. Um, so a little bit about me. My name is Mirsa. Uh, I've been working with Embedded Linux in well, the last seven years. Uh, started out more at hardware side, like hardware development, uh, also doing lower level stuff like U-Boot and Linux kernel development. And the last two or three years, it's mostly been Yocto and build root, build systems, uh, creating custom distributions and stuff like that. Uh, and I am uh, working with uh, an embedded solutions architect at uh, Northern Tech, uh, and I also work with the Mender.io project, uh, which is an over-the-air updater for embedded Linux. And we also have a boot upstairs, so if you have any questions about that, uh, you're welcome to join us. Uh, so let's start with the desktop environment. Uh, so developing applications on a desktop or laptop system where you have Ubuntu, generally everything is available to you through an apt-get install if you're missing some dependency library or you need development tools like CMake or Make. or oh, It's all available to you pretty easily. It's just apt-get install and you're good to go. You also have a high availability of trace tools and debug tools like AGB, GDB, uh, S-Trace, and other, other things. So you have a lot more control over your, when you're running your binary, for example. Uh, you can easily de debug it uh, since you are, you are building and running and testing on the same machine. So, and you generally, when you are able to do this, you have very short cycles of making code changes, building to testing. Uh, and generally, I mean, I, I would probably try to keep development as much as possible on a desktop or on a PC, uh, and even go to some extent to mock uh, certain hardware features to be able to do some basic uh, sanity testing on uh, the desktop environment, just because you get these short cycles of changing code, building, and deploying, so to say. Um, but also be aware that, like, uh, it's mostly basic testing because you are not testing on your dedicated hardware where this will run eventually. Um, and you also have maybe have some constraints that uh, if, if your embedded device is uh, less uh, powerful, uh, that also has an effect on your binaries and stuff like that. Um, 
So you, you can go to the, like, when you go to the desktop uh, embedded, to your embedded system, you can probably reproduce most of the, the applications. Uh, you have access to like ARMBN, Ubuntu, or Raspbian, uh, if you're running embedded devices, which are similar to a desktop environment that you have on your laptop. So you, you can install development tools on that as well, uh, make, see, make, git, uh, and you can use that as a development workstation, but you shouldn't really, because uh, generally it's very slow. It's not like uh, compile times are terrible, uh, and it, you cannot really set up the this exact same environment that you have on, on, on your PC. Uh, um, so it's not really viable, viable in the long run. So what we need to do, start doing, is cross-device development, right? Uh, we cannot really use our embedded devices as uh, development stations. So we need to use our laptops or desktops, uh, which are much faster. But when it's, then we need to start cross-compiling uh, application, and that's when it starts to get a bit complicated. Uh, but this is the accepted approach nowadays, and this is how generally most people do it using Yocto or Buildroot or other build systems to cross-compile on a more powerful machine and then transfer it to the device, only the binary stuff. But it also introduces complexity because now you have a, you compile the code in one place and now you need to transfer it to one device or transfer it to multiple devices and then you need to run testing. And this is where it gets a bit messy. Uh, so like the initial approach or the entry point that most people have experienced in this room probably, uh, you need to transfer files between your laptop or the desktop and your device. So you can easily do that with a secure copy, for example, SSH, uh, or you take a USB stick, transfer it. Uh, but this, this, is like the, yeah, this is the entry point, and it's surprisingly how many people are, they stop here. Uh, this is how they develop applications for embedded devices. Uh, but this is, of course, error prone, and this is not something that you, 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 it's a lot of manual work, and there's people still trying to automate this as well, but uh, uh, it's not really recommended. So then you, if you have, if you're using ID integrated development environments, they usually have some kind of uh, plugins or to be able to, to cross-compile, and usually you have some kind of post build hooks, which will transfer your binary to the device uh, and run it. So you can, from the IDE, uh, run your binary on the device. For example, in the, if you're using Qt Creator, you can launch uh, the debug server on the device and also connect and do debugging remotely. Um, but people, uh, it's not very common to use. I don't use IDs that much either, at least. Uh, so the next step would be, okay, uh, we have package managers. That's pretty familiar to all of us. Uh, that's how, how we install applications on our laptops. So, and with that, you get uh, some kind of more sanity checks, more controls. You can state dependencies that uh, the binary that you're installing uh, is dependence, has dependencies on this version of this library. So you get more and more sanity checks uh, to avoid, avoid the error-prone manual transfer of devices. And generally, there's three popular uh, package managers. Uh, you have the Debian um, one and Fedora and uh, Open. Yeah, OPKG. Uh, so the step, what, what you would do, uh, trying to utilize that, you'll probably add a step in your build system uh, when you're compiling your application. Uh, if you're using make, let's say it's make Debian package, right? So it packages your binary, and if your application has some extra configuration files along with it, uh, and it packages in a deb file, that you can then transfer to your device and install. Uh, and this, again, gives you more uh, dependency tracking, sanity checks, uh, and it gets a bit uh, less error prone. Um, you can also uh, provide custom package feeds uh, where you can upload your, uh, your Debian package that you create for your application uh, and make it easily 
available to your devices. Uh, and package managers are useful usually during development or prototyping when you're working with a better device. Uh, you, you, you're trying to debug something, you notice, oh, I'm missing a tool like S-Trace or TCP dump or iPerf or whatever. Uh, and then you just run up to get and install and you can continue on debugging whatever problem you're doing right now. But this is not always the case. Uh, you don't have package managers on all emb embedded devices. This is generally if you're using a Debian or Ubuntu or Raspbian or something like that in your embedded system. Uh, but if you, if you don't have that, uh, this is a comparison, I can skip that. Uh, and I'm going to focus a bit more on, on uh, Yocto project and Uwe Core uh, and how to utilize, create package feeds uh, in this environment similar to what you would have in a uh, Debian style system. So there's something called the Ongserm distribution, uh, which, is, uh, which maintains uh, package feeds. Uh, they have a meta Ongserm layer. And, and it seems that it's, I haven't used it in a while, uh, but it, I checked it up. They, it, still, it seems that it's still maintained, and they have a Sumo branch uh, from this year. Uh, so this is what you typically would do, uh, is include Meta Angst Angstrom in your Yocto builds, uh, and set your distribution to Angstrom, and then you get package feeds uh, that the Angstrom distribution maintains. So this is, uh, this is also helpful uh, while doing prototyping or early development of your embedded platform, uh, if you're using that. Uh, but, uh, but also, Angstrom is a, a lot more than package feeds, so you don't, maybe you don't want to use it uh, for other reasons. Uh, the package feeds are nice, but maybe in the long run, you're trying to create a more customized uh, based on Pokey or uh, something like that. Uh, and then there's a way uh, to create this as well, using Yocto Uwe Core. This is how Meta Angstrom does it as, as well. Uh, so Yocto generates package feeds for you, basically. When you do a build, Im image build, uh, you will get uh, one of the out output directories is uh, uh, packages. So and you can choose between RPM, DEB, and IPK. Uh, and it's stored under the temp deploy IPK. So that's just the packages. Uh, and it's yet not yet a, a complete package feed. So what you normally would need to do is there's a command that's a bit big, package index, that generates all the files that the package, management, that you, package manager that you're running on device needs. Uh, so after you have run the package index command, uh, you can simply expose the deploy folder where all your packages are on a simple HTTP server, uh, which makes it accessible on the local network for your device. Uh, but this only fixes the, like the server-side package feed uh, in this case. So what you need, you also need the tools uh, on your uh, embedded device. So there's an extra image feature that you can set, uh, that's uh, package management. That will install if you're using uh, uh, EPIC, yeah, if you, whatever package manager you choose, it will install the device-specific tools needed to fetch packages. Uh, there's also a, a template file, uh, or, or it's a resp complete recipe, actually. Uh, in Meta Open Embedded, which is called Distro Feed Configs. Uh, so if you include that in your build, it will generate the configuration files needed for your package manager uh, that you run on the, your device. And there are some configuration param parameters that you can set. Uh, and the interesting is the URL uh, or the IP address on the local network where your package feed is, let me say. But I don't, uh, yeah, and if we take a look at uh, like, what, what that uh, recipe creates, uh, in the case if you're using um, Upico G, uh, it creates all the, like, the feed configuration files depending on ar architecture, also generic packages, and, uh, and this is all output from Yocto. Uh, and you can see the URL. Uh, 
that's configurable. So if you change that to your local IP address, uh, you basically have a local package feed uh, that you can utilize. So and the workflow, if you, if you set this up uh, while doing um, development uh, in some way, uh, then it's easy to make changes in your build environment. Uh, you just and you rebuild the image, and then you rebuild the package index, and then it's available for your device to fetch. Uh, you don't have to reflash the device with a disk image each time you make a change. Uh, you can also run the uh, bitbake world command uh, that will generate packages for everything that's buildable in your environment, basically. Uh, so it builds that usually, but yeah, that takes a while. So you should. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But that's a way of like providing a more complete package feed. Even if if uh, at build when you build the image, uh, maybe you don't know what package you will need. So Bitbake World will, will build everything. Then it's a, available through a package feed uh, to your device while doing a development. Any questions or like you can interrupt me while. Uh, well, going. So this is something I've also, I've never done this myself, uh, but apparently there's people doing this, and sure they can do that. Uh, but uh, in, 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 the, in the server world or like enterprise, uh, it's very common to have some kind of configuration management tool uh, to manage a fleet of servers or uh, and there's a lot of tools uh, that are available. There's uh, CF Engine, Puppet, Ansible, Chef. Uh, and these are all uh, auto configuration, auto automation uh, over a large fleet of devices. Uh, and some are applying uh, these uh, workflows uh, to embedded devices as well. Uh, so that means you have some kind of golden image that you install on all your devices. Then you need to install the configuration management server uh, on your device. This is usually something like a, a manual work that you would do during provisioning. Uh, and you also have to set up connectivity and trust between your configuration management server and the device. And then you are able to script uh, the configuration of your device using these tools, uh, which is an interesting approach uh, as well. Uh, so, but. Usually, when working with embedded systems, you you have a dedicated. In some cases, you build a certain hardware hardware for a certain use case, and then you have some custom kernel, and you have some custom kernel options that you depend on, uh, and then you write some application that integrates with other system components in the system. Uh, so it's not a single binary anymore. Uh, it's, it's starting to get like a full system. Uh, that you have developing, so you, testing usually involves you, uh, you have to deploy everything to test uh, reliably, and otherwise you're just uh, testing a single binary in a complete system, so to say. And when you move on to this, uh, more like uh, system level testing, or uh, when your application grows and, and it's integrating with other components in the system, uh, there are way, other ways of doing it. Uh, and one way is network booting, uh, which is pretty common in uh, continuous integration systems as well. Uh, and what you, what you do is you provide all the resources necessary to boot your device on network. So the device on boot fetches both the Linux kernel, device tree, and the root file system, uh, meaning that you just need to reboot the device uh, to update the software. Uh, but there, are, there is some complexity involved in setting up uh, network booting. Uh, but it can also be easily extended to multiple devices. So if you have 10 devices that you want to deploy the same software, uh, maybe they are interacting with each other as well. Uh, this is a way of doing that. Uh, so network booting, uh, it's pretty common to use something called Pixie Linux uh, or Pixie, Pixie Boot in U-Boot, if you're using U-Boot as the bootloader. Uh, and Pixie Boot in U-Boot is a, almost a derivative of Pixie Linux. Uh, 
And what you, what you are using basically is uh, TFTP. Uh, so you have a TFTP server somewhere. It can be your laptop or desktop, or you have a central system where you put your build artifacts or your, yeah, that you want to deploy to your devices. Um, and this is what, the, what a typical uh, Pixie boot uh, configuration file looks like. Uh, there, there is more complexity in setting this up. But, but, but what this means is that uh, every time that the device reboots, it's going to fetch the software from the network. Uh, and then it makes it somewhat easier to deploy. Um, but you can also script it uh, using uh, the, the boot shell uh, or hush shell. Uh, language uh, and like we are just TFTP uh, the kernel image and the device tree and then set up a network file storage mount of the root file system and again this is pretty common used in uh, continuous integration systems you can also set, set this up for your development workflow uh, to optimize the time you spend on waiting for like software to be transferred or, or yeah. Yeah, and in the end, uh, similar to network booting, when you need to have a, a, a complete system that you are testing, that's both the Linux kernel and your applica application binaries and configuration files uh, where you have applied custom configurations uh, all across the device. Uh, so there's a lot of like uh, update solutions nowadays. Uh, I work with one of them, Mender, but there's Rauk, there's Software Update, SW Update, uh, and there's more. Uh, and if you integrate one of these early on in the develop proce development process, you can use these as uh, development tools to deploy your builds to devices real, reliably, but also like on, on many devices, if you're testing uh, many devices. Mm. One benefit is also that you're like, it's similar if you're deploying the same system in production for doing software updates. Uh, you test it throughout the whole development process. Uh, if you are using the same tool to build confidence that everything is working, that the, the tools are appropriately configured and that they are working. Um, and if you, some of these are using uh, image-based updates, uh, which is really nice when doing testing, because image-based means that your devices are stateless. When you flash them with an image, or you flash 10 devices with the same image, you are pretty sure what, the software, what software you're running on these devices. So there's no, like, someone has entered the device or changed a configuration file that affects uh, your tests or, uh, yeah. but also one benefit if these, these update solutions generally have a uh, robustness built in, so you're not breaking devices, because that can be quite tedious if you are doing development work and you do, you do, not do an update and you brick your device and you have to pull out all your tools to reflash it. And uh, so that's also a help to, ease the devel development flow, so to say. Uh, and it also fits well into developer workflows, uh, like build system integration. You have some kind of something that produces uh, a bin an image that you need to transfer to your device, um, which are build artifacts. And then generally you have some kind of central place if you, if you have a, if you have an update solution that's able to do over there updates, um, you probably have some kind of management server, um, and you can utilize this uh, in your development cycles uh, to update or test on, on, on larger fleets reali reliably. And just uh, since I'm using, I'm working with Mender. Uh, I'm, I'm using Mender a lot uh, as a development tool as well. Uh, and Mender does uh, like uh, deploys a A/B update strategy, which means that you have to you have uh, two full copies of the operating system, and you do image-based updates. So you always update the whole system, uh, and you can Mender works both in like a command line mode. So I can set up um, 
expose my artifacts on the local network, uh, and if I have terminal access to my device, I can apply that update by a simple command line uh, command. But I, I can also in integrate it in uh, like the Mendo server uh, uh, with my CI uh, continuous integration loop. Uh, so that when I push, up, push changes, uh, they're automatically built and they can be automatically deployed to certain devices as well. And this is generally what the command would look like if I'm on the client uh, terminal um, to fetch an artifact and apply it. Uh, I think that's it. I'm pretty fast, but that's okay. Any questions? Oh, do I ask questions? Oh. Okay. okay. Uh, so on the slide where you were talking about uh, package feeds with Yocto, um, how broadly applicable uh, are those packages? Are they very specific to the particular board you built for, or can they be built so that you know, the, obviously, the the the, the uh, uh, ARM core or whatever can mm -hmm. can they be used on other kinds of platforms? Typically, yeah, yeah. The configuration files includes uh, recipes. Generally, specify okay. If a recipe specifies this is an ARM specific package, then it's going to end up in an ARM specific folder in the package field. So if you're running like x86, you won't get access to. So that, that's one of the benefits of using that distro feed config. It's, it generates configuration files based on your current architecture that you are building uh, with your image. So you can have multiple architecture. You can like you can have both ARM and x86 uh, feeds in the same folder, as long as the configuration files po points to the correct locations. Thank you. Hmm. <coughs> Have you considered uh, using the, the Yocto way of test image to create like a test image integration for Mender? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think we're, we're not using that. Uh, I've used it in other projects. Uh, our testing framework is based on uh, Python, PyTest, and uh, Fabric, I think. Um, so that's what we... But I have used the uh, Yocto test framework in other projects, which is pretty nice. Uh, and it's fairly easy to set up. Uh, yeah, so is, is your framework available for the users of Mender, or is it all just when you develop <coughs> Mender? So, I mean, the, all our QA is open source. It's only that we have a Jenkins server that runs the builds. That's not publicly accessible, but all the scripts we are using is publicly available. Uh, hi. Hmm. I was wondering, you're, you're promoting packages. Uh, is, this, is this just for deployment and then AB images for production and, or, uh, sorry, development versus production? Or is this yeah, it's generally package managers are, they are really good while develop, developing, uh, but not something that I would use deploying. So during production, production you'd you prefer an AB image? Yeah, I prefer a, image updates generally. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Could you please explain at what level Mender works? Is it kind of extension to U-Boot or any other bootloader, or it's a user space application? So how it generally works? It's everything <laughs> that you mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they're, they're, it's, a, it's a client in user space that you have. It's the Mender client. Uh, it's a management server. Uh, uh, but the Mender client requires U-Boot integration, because you need to have control of the boot command. If you are having, you need to switch, like, which partition am I booting right now? And that, uh, that happens in U-Boot. So, all of that. <laughs> okay, if there's no more questions, thank you for listening. And have a great, good lunch. <laughs>